gamers all around the flat universe. The tournament has ended and the chimps reign supreme. Chimps, we won, we did it. Last week, we had a 4-3 match against Los Pollos Hermanos. Close one, but Marine Lord and I won the last game and managed to win 4-3. And this week, Five zero. Let's get into some of the games. So we played against the Canadian uh, plus Casva team, aka three beavers and a turkey, which was consisting of Wham, Puppy Paw, I Am Magic, and Casva. So uh, this was a best of nine. For those that don't know, we had a lot of stuff prepared. Um, I I did a lot of uh, like pre planning, like what possible sieves we could play. I don't know if my let me see if my notepad thing is still here. I mean, I can show this right. The tournament's over, so whatever. So yeah, this was. Uh, I don't know if you guys are interested, but this is our. Uh, this is like the pre-made stuff uh, that I've made, and then I ran it by like the Muslim and the Marine Lord, and we kind of sorted it. But uh, this is basically the sieves that we had remaining, so you can kind of ignore this. There was basically two of these. So every time we, they play the sim or we play the sim, I removed it so it's easier for us to see. So basically what uh, what we did is um, we decided to take the maps, which I'm going to find out in a second. I'll just go full out. I, I usually don't go fully in details how we did stuff, but like I said, the term is over. So, you know, we won, so might as well reveal all the secrets, right? So basically what happened is when we did the, the picks and vetoes, like, we predicted exactly what they're going to pick. Like, the four maps that they picked, we predicted exactly what they're going to pick. Um, and the way this format worked is the bands were at the end. So, usually the bands are at the start of the tournament or after the first picks. But this tournament, the bands were at the end. So, Golden Heights, I know, is one of their favorite maps. And in practice versus them, before the finals, obviously, we didn't practice with them for the finals. Uh, they always beat us on Golden Heights, and we were trying out a lot of stuff, a lot of sieves on Golden Heights. And they had, I think, like, beaten us every single time there. Um, we knew that Coastal was their favorite map, or one of their favorite maps, and they loved playing it. And we also lost in Coastal last week. Wetlands, uh, they never vetoed, and they played it, like, three times as the first map, or two times as the first map, but it was always in, and it seems like a sieve that, or a map that... Uh, they like and they won on and then Oasis is the map that we always vetoed we've never practiced it but for the finals we did we made strategies for it and um, we kind of predicted that these are going to be the four maps uh, that they're going to be picking so uh, Wetlands, Pit or Dry Arabia was up in the air which one they're going to pick because they're basically the same map they're, they're, they're open maps on the other side what we did is we picked we had a completely different strategy we didn't pick the maps we liked necessarily we didn't pick the maps that they didn't like necessarily uh we had a completely different approach we went with what maps can we screw them over completely with the sieve picks so let me explain that prairie is an open map technically but some sieves are just way stronger than the others. So what we did is we picked Prairie first. So we have the map choice. Because if you lose the game, loser picks which next map goes. So if um, the first map was Dry Arabia. So if we lost it, we get to pick one of these four maps as the next map. So we figured that Prairie has the highest priority. Because if... Let's say we play Wetlands and we play Dry Arabia. If we save like Mongol, English, French, stills like that, and there's Prairie, we can pick Prairie and then they're going to be left with like weird sieves on it, like Abbasid or China or Rus or Delhi that are not so good on it. So we figured if we just force them to play other maps and then we pick Prairie and we still have our own good sieves, we just get an auto win. Uh, we have the same thought process for uh, uh, Jousting Fields. For example, if they pick Coastal, China is a very common pick there. So if they pick Coastal, we could potentially, we have the option, right, to not pick China and then we pick Jousting Fields next and we pick China, which is very strong because it's basically a one-on-one -on -one map. 
And then we picked King of the Hill because it's a very versatile map. And this is where we practiced Abbasid and Rus, which is kind of two sieves that are hard to fit in on any maps. And we picked Golden Swamp because of two reasons. Uh, we beat them every time in practice on that map. They also lost on that map a lot. And we also can uh, fit in kind of weird sieves. You can play a lot of stuff for Golden Swamp, but we mainly practice like weird sieves on it, like Delhi, uh, Achery, and Malians the most. Whereas other people tend to use like good sieves on it. So we figured we can use that map to either force them to use good picks or we just use our uh, quote unquote bad picks. So regarding the maps, uh, like I said, we pre-planned this, we pre-planned our picks and it worked out great. And then we uh, basically, just in case, we had a first map potentially picks. So we knew that we're picking these four maps, right? So those maps cannot be first, obviously. So we didn't pre-pick for those. But all the other maps we made uh, uh, pre-picks for so that we came in with a plan, we came in prepared. And because there was a high chance that uh, first map is gonna be Pit or Dry Arabia, because usually the open maps are the first maps, uh, we, I, I played a lot of Delhi. I played a lot of Delhi recently. I played a, uh, every time I warmed up, I played Delhi as well. So we knew that basically the plan was if it's Dry Arabia and the Pit, uh, Marine Lord and I are playing that. If it's Wetlands, Marine Lord and I are playing that. If it's Oasis, we had two options. Abbasid or Bongos is something we practiced uh, a lot. And then Abbasid versus Ottomans. And this is going to be me and Marine Lord, and this is going to be uh, Ben and Marine Lord, aka Demaz and Marine Lord. And then the last one, uh, if it's coastal, we had basically two options. Um, it's like either me and Demaz or Demaz and Marine Lord. And then uh, the last one, same thing. The reason why Marine Lord and I did not play on water maps together, or we did not plan to play any water maps together, is because Marine Lord and I played a lot of ladder. Uh, we practiced a lot of the open maps. Uh, in custom games as well and we almost never ever lost on open maps so we figured if there's an open map him and I should play for sure because we're probably the me the most like well practiced together I would say out of any team um, and we haven't lost a single game in the tournament together so uh, you know it worked out um, then we had some like picks here I'm not gonna go through all of them but it's basically which sieve is playable slash good on which map so equal obviously means these two maps, Delhi is equally good and then Golden Swap playable, but not too great. So we kind of had an overview uh, because we didn't want to get in like, um, we didn't want to get into like weird situations where everything's good, everything is good. And then it's like adjusting fields and we got Delhi that sucks right on that map. That's why we had a lot of like pre-planned stuff. We knew what we were playing where and the maps were spread out well enough so that we never got stuck with bad sieves basically which I feel like sometimes the teams did have. It's like they win two games and they're like, oh, we got crap saves for the third game, so they lose. We made sure we have none of that. So let's get into game number one. So game number one was Dry Arabia. Uh, we thought it would be Dry Arabia, the pit or wetlands for game number one, uh, which was really good for us. And I think this is one of the, uh, I'm not sure mistakes, but maybe oversights that they made. Uh, Marine Lord and I, like I said, always played the open maps. So, in my opinion, they should have uh, not made first map open map. Because uh, another thing, one of the rules in the tournament is... if uh, So, in 2v2s, you have to play all three combos before you can play again. So, for example, Marine Lord and I cannot play two games in a row. We have to play... And then me and the Muslim, and then the Muslim and Marine Lord, and then Marine Lord and I can play. But whoever starts in the first series in 2v2 can also play in the fourth series. So, if what I mean by that, this might be a little confusing, but if Marine Lord and I played in uh, third match, or third 2v2, we cannot play in the fourth. Even though all the combos were done with each player, we cannot play in the fourth. So you cannot play three times in a row. So what that means is whoever plays the first game in 2v2 can play again in the fourth uh, 2v2 match. So the reason why I say this is an oversight from them is because if they forced an non-open map 
we would have probably sent another combo that obviously you know we're all like the muslim and marine lord are good together me and the muslim are good together but this is our strongest comp so if i was them i would probably pick the open maps so they cannot be first map and that way you you split away marine lord and i which is again the place we got the most practice in um but yeah that's just like a small thing that they could have done but uh you know didn't work out anyway um we gave it a lot of thought and we didn't play delhi english until semi-finals because we wanted to fit in delhi somewhere and we figured the pit and dry arabia are the best sieves for it um we didn't really know what sieves to play it with initially and we didn't want it like we didn't want to pair it with a terrible sieve because then delhi is a little bit slow right it needs time to speed up to pump up and we decided to pair it with a strong sieve probably the strongest sieve in team games which is english because english covers everything that delhi does not have um basically it has the early aggression he can potentially defend me if i am getting rushed and english can put pressure while delhi builds up and then we can put a lot of pressure and feudal together so it actually felt like a really good combo something that we haven't seen anyone play so we knew it's going to be you know a good thing to mix up because they probably haven't had a lot of practice against it um in the earlier rounds of tournament we were using english mongol a lot but then we realized that those two sieves are probably the two strongest sieves in 2v2 so we didn't want to use them together. We kind of wanted to spread out the, uh, the the OP a little bit, if that makes sense. We wanted to make sure that in each set we had at least one strong sieve. Instead of having like a two strong sieves and then two weak sieves. And then two strong sieves and then two weak sieves kind of thing. Uh, because if you get like... I mean, if, if you pick Mongol English then you lose, then it's really bad for you. Because, you know, then you use your kind of strongest point and you lost with it so we decided delhi english on open maps is really really good because it deals well with everything we kind of uh we thought about this a lot uh, the most common combos on dry arabia and the pit and wetlands are um english french english mongol uh french mongol ottoman french ottoman mongol Basically any variation of the four sieves, the, the, the English, the French, the Mongol, and the Ottoman. Any variation of those, maybe English Ottoman isn't good, but any variation of those is, uh, they're the best combos for the open maps. So we figured, how do we sneak in a sieve that's not good on, on versus those sieves, but might be, but is good on that map and might be good with some other sieve. And Delhi is honestly the hardest sieve with Abbasid to fit into 2v2 and 3v3 games. So we figured, yeah, if Delhi doesn't take too much damage early on, it's actually a really good sieve in one-on-one -on -one against any of those sieves if the game kind of moves forward. And like I said, English provides that, so Delhi worked out. Um, so yeah, that's the thought behind, uh, behind picking Delhi and behind picking English here. And this game was pretty straightforward. Um, now I'll talk more about the games. Um, Marine Lord went for men at arms, uh, denied some gold from the French, forced him to make horsemen instead of knights, which again gave me some time to, to build up, to, you know, chill, to not lose workers early on. And um, he also managed to deny some gold from the Mongols because um, Mongols' gold is right here, it's not safe. And yeah, at this point, we knew that they're gonna trade because that's been the meta for a lot of teams in team games. And we know that, uh, you know, Wen loves trading. Um, now, this is an interesting one. I'm not sure what the thought process behind this was. Maybe just a little misstep. Maybe he didn't expect the army fast enough. But he produced four archers out of the double archer production. And he just kind of sent them across the map. So we saw this with Marine Lord Scout. We saw that the archers are, like, moving out. And... Marine Lord like just sat on this one like is there any way you can attack that can you intercept that I was like yeah yeah, yeah. I'm going so I sent the horseman and I picked off four archers super early on which is quite massive because they are trying to put on the pressure and we're trying to put on the pressure and you lose four 
of your six units, that's pretty bad. So here I find the archers. I don't know if they wanted to like meet up here and then Kazva went around instead. I I'm not sure. I mean, I, I don't think it was a miss rally because they're clearly going forward and now Khan is joining. So I don't know what happened there. Maybe he didn't expect the horsemen. Maybe they didn't scout. I'm not sure. But he loses the two archers. The knight arrives. But then I see the two more archers. And I just go for those two. Marine Lord pulls the boar. I was like, pull the boar, pull the boar, pull the boar. Uh, so the boar helps us a little bit as well. And yeah, losing four archers this early at this high level is insane. And you're about to see why. So... Our game plan was to just slowly take sacred sites. And um, by the way, Marine Lord might be uploading these games on his YouTube channel from his point of view, like when he played. So, um, yeah, if you want to check those with comms, um, I don't know when he's going to upload them, though. Um, so, yeah, and our plan was for me to harass the trade and for him to help me take the sacred sites. That was our plan. Nothing aggressive. Like, they're Mongol French, so we can't really be aggressive on them. Kazva then proceeds to lose three horsemen here and a scout, which is also a great pickup. So the start was great for us. Like, really, really good. I managed to pick off this knight. And we were kind of, like, we, we didn't expect this, right? This kind of start. So Marino was like, do we push? Do we push? And I was like, uh, like, why not? Let's do it. Um, he said that he already uploaded the first game. All right, there you go. So, yeah. We didn't uh, uh, expect that we were going to be pushing this early, but because we killed three horsemen, a scout, four archers, and a knight for free, by the way. We didn't lose anything. Um, yeah, there's the knight pickup. We were like, okay, let's go push. Fuck it. Because their golds are close. Which is good for them, but in this situation it's bad because they just lost a bunch of units. So, yeah, this is where we were like, okay, let's go. Fuck it. So we deny gold of Mongols, uh, then we deny gold of French, while taking the sacred sites. They, they wall this off, which is pretty annoying for us. And they tower the top uh, sacred site, which I didn't see because we were fighting here. And I was trying to wall off this amazing sacred site with this crap gold. So this is the funny part. Did I not see this? Okay, so this is what happened. I I actually I actually didn't see these traders in game. So Marinor told me there's four traders on the map. So I figured because the trade post is here that the trade is gonna be this way, right? So I shift you you can see they're going there. While I was taking the sacred side here. And I'm trying to find the trade. And I just can't fucking find it. So I'm like, where is the trade? So you attack here, I'm like, maybe the trade is shorter, but they put the trade on this side, which is kind of smart. So then I go back this way, because I'm like, I didn't know where it was, so I'm like, maybe it's on the other side? Which is shorter, but, you know, maybe. Meanwhile, I was trying to take the sights, uh, Marine Lord got this tower down, I captured his side, we captured the middle sacred side, and this is where... I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't say I necessarily fell apart, it's just that Kazva raided really, really, really well. And you'll see what I mean in a second. Like, I got raided like hell. So I take the sacred side. I go for a raid over here. I'm still trying to find- by the way, now I missed the traders because I was looking here. Now I missed the traders. And I'm confused because I can't find the trade post or uh, the silver tree, but it was here, KKW. Um, and we didn't know because if Marine Lord knew, he could have just fucking killed it. So Kazma starts raiding me and he goes really, really bad for me. Like, he starts raiding here, he was raiding my gold, soon he'll start raiding here. So he did really, really well with his knights. Like, he was microing them really well. The rough for them was, uh, the start for them was a bit rough. Like, they misplayed it. Uh, but from here on out, they played well. Also, I think that... Uh, I mean, Marine Lord's in the chat, but I think he should have, like, made a tower here, probably. Because uh, it was, like, a free, right? We had full control. So tower here maybe would have been nice. But I guess it doesn't matter too much. 
where it didn't matter. So yeah, he's raiding here. I'm trying to chase with the Spearman. There's more knights coming. And I just start taking a lot of damage from here now. And because there's no gold villagers here, we knew that Cass is on the gold on this side. So Marino will try to pressure that. Uh, and the sacred side is slowly ticking. Now this is the thing. Men at arms in this situation are... Okay, but not great. And this is why we never actually played this combo. We never played uh, Mongol French. Unless English was already picked. And this is why. Mongol French is actually really good if you can make Mangudai. But because we have English, we have longbows, you cannot make Mangudai. Like, it's just not gonna work. English is gonna pick everything up. And this creates a huge problem in the unit composition of our team. Because French obviously goes knights. He has to. That's French in team games. But what does Mongol do? Because Mongol should be doing archers, right? To cover for the spearmen. But the problem is he's trading, so he should make gold units. So what units do you make? You have to go men at arm, knights, or mangudai. Mangudai are not good. If you make knights, you're basically just making the same thing. So you're kind of forced indirectly to make men at arms, which are okay, but one of the worst civs to make mass men at arms against is English because their longbows got longer range and they can kite really, really easily. And another civ, which is Delhi. So men at arms in this situation are possibly, like if this was against like Ottoman or I don't know like uh, I'm trying to think like maybe Rus uh, Rus has knights though it would be okay but Delhi scholars can out heal men at arm damage so even though even though men at arms technically counter this and counter my army with the healing they don't so yeah so i feel like their unit comp is just doomed from the get-go so now i'm getting raided a lot like i said earlier kaz is doing, doing a really really good job with the raids and we're just pushing together right now and even though he's castle and you'll see the amount of men at arms he'll have we still ended up fighting them the whole time because like i said men at arms don't have enough dps to actually uh defeat our army and then knights can't engage our army because we both have spears so knights were fully used as raiding unit and they didn't really have a, a fighting army that can kill our army because our army cannot die we can simply run away french knights are not going to kill us and men at arms are not going to catch up with us so we go here and look men at arms and so many knights we just decide to go for a fight i had two scholars which wasn't too many but you can see the men at arms are slowly dying the spears are killing the knights and even though we have a bunch of feudal units it's working out great castle is still raiding behind like when you play french you want the civ that has the punch behind it you know french's job look by the way um uh, again i sent another unit uh, another line of units i think they came through here on a move and then shift queued backwards so the traders were not here when the, they moved through. So they attacked through and I still didn't find the trade. <laughs> so that was really funny. Um, but yeah, when you play French, you want the civ that you're allied with to be able to have a massive, massive army. That's why Ottoman French is really good because Ottoman can bring mass archers and actually like a death ball army. English French is really good because English can bring mass spearmen longbow to try to end the opponent while French is harassing. But English Mongol, if you're gonna build Mangudai, it's just not, not that good because you don't have a direct engagement. Especially not against our Sims, like I said earlier. So there's some men at arms that are gonna be running around here. Also, I think if he, uh, if he got plus two uh, attack for his units it would be a lot better. Um, it would increase their DPS by a lot. But yeah, he, he goes for attack here. He can't harass English, right? Because of TC and attack speed aura. Um, I had just 
trapped on a unit that could have, again, with Scholar healing, just deflect the men at arms. Here they, we go for another engagement, I think. This time, it, it's not as good for us because there's a lot of men at arms. But we're both gonna age up uh, in a little bit. So you can see, men at arms are tanking, but there's just so, so many units that it doesn't matter, right? I'm still getting raided. I did lose probably like 10 villagers from all the raids. And again, look, this is the problem. This is me just A moving, so I wasn't like my train. I lost A horse. I think he. Oh, yeah, we were gathering units because there were more members coming. But you get the point, right? So, right now. I aged up, and Marine Lord, I think, ages up in a little bit, and I just started taking relics. Started getting all my upgrades as well, which in about 2-3 minutes, like, my save is gonna become way, way more powerful. Um, I still didn't find the trade, I think. Oh no, I did find the trade, sorry. We killed a couple of traders here, and you can see there's damage in them, so we finally found the trade. And we instantly went for it. Or we went for the sacred stuff first, and I think we went for the trade right after. And again, the game goes on. He has been trading the whole time, by the way. So he's in a pretty good position. It's not the longest trade ever, right? But it's a pretty good, pretty good trade. Um, he's getting how much gold? 100 gold per trip. So like I said, pretty good, not massive, um, but there's just no Unicom that I feel like they can go for. So we decide to go for a massive push. I start making Knights and Men-at-Arms, because their comp is uh, Feudal Knights and Men-at-Arms. Like if I just make mass Knights, I can actually beat their army alone. Marine Lord went for a lot of Men-at-Arms uh, himself. What is this, Marine Lord? Where upgrade? I'm joking. He probably just tapes up. So anyway, um, so yeah, uh, right now we feel we felt pretty good. Like I lost some villagers, but I had sacred sites the whole time. Uh, I'm starting to pick up relics. I'm starting to mine stone, and I went for compound defender to get the keeps down. And we actually didn't even pay attention to the sacred site. Um, we were just like feeling pretty confident just harassing uh, we have a spearman here so you know he's not mining gold and we kept good track of where Kazma's gold was so we obviously know his gold is here and my upgrades are halfway done so once those finish that's gonna be way better for us you'll hear relics being picked up and we just just decided to go for a trade. I have 10 scholars here. I got seven knights, which is pretty, pretty good number. And Marine Lord just has a massive working army. He made a lot of men at arms uh, so that uh, so that he can tank the enemy men at arms and I can just heal him up. So here we go for a trade finally, and we just kind of mow everything down. Sick wall here. And yeah, this is a craft on a man at arms. But again, this is not the you know the one-two army, as I like to call it. Um, some people wondered why is Kazva not fighting? He he I mean now maybe he can, because there's not as many spear. I mean Marine Lord has a lot of spears actually. But you cannot really engage into this massive army with knights. Like he'll just get picked off with the uh, with the spear super easily, and he has been raiding the whole time. The problem is we can defend that, but uh, Wham alone cannot defend two armies. So here you can see we're kind of both have some losses, but this comes the point where there's not enough DPS in his army, and I still have every single scholar alive. This is where I dropped my first keep, 
this first key doesn't protect, um, in, in a way it doesn't protect anything, but it protects a lot of things. So it protects this gold, um, it protects, I mean, it's the, it's basically in front of both of our bases, right? So we have a rally point that's safe, protects this sacred side. Um, so it was just like a good starting keep, like I don't need to drop a keep here, I can just send two knights or something. And then I went for the second keep on the north. Uh, so that I can block off this gold, block off the berries, and block off the, the trade. Um, Kazva the Madman, he had uh, oh, a lot of his 20 villagers here, which we didn't see. And then I think he goes like from these berries. Yeah, he goes in those berries and goes in this gold. So we spot that, and then we spot this gold too. And he just loses a bunch of villagers. I got another keep there. The trade continues in the corner, which we spotted. I'm raiding Kazma on this side, and I got another keep here. So basically, there's three keeps now to kind of split the map. I send the knights. So now, while we're fighting... Oh yeah, and I took all seven relics, by the way. So that was like pretty good gold. So while we're fighting here, I sent four knights on this side. Which killed like every single traitor that arrived. And... Like, even if we lose this whole army, like right now, if you just delete this whole army, we still win the game, like, extremely easily, because they have no economy. Kazva has no food eco, uh, his food is about to completely run out, his gold is fucked here, 700 gold, he has no other golds to go. This is his other gold, this is his other gold, but it keeps under them. Um, Wham's eco with farms is pretty good, or uh, pastures, but his trade all went down. And then to end it all off, I just decided to do a little, you know, a little, uh, where you going, bish move. And right here in the middle, we even managed to pretty much win the fight. Like, there's a bunch of crossbows, but there's a keep, so they tap out. Overall, this first map, we felt pretty confident uh, into the sieve picks we had. We felt pretty good about them. Uh, the start was really good for us, uh, like the first, you know, when we picked up a couple of units was really, really good. And then Kazu did a really, really good job harassing and Wem did a, a good job just hiding the trade because we, I mean, we literally couldn't find it and, uh, or I couldn't find it. And in the end, I think that, you know, Delhi Power Spike kind of hit in, Marine Lord had a crap ton of longbows. He never like lost any. Because he always kept micring the back and, and you know stutter step micring so in the end uh even with the trade going on for basically longer than it should have because we could have stopped it earlier we managed to grab the dub which we were pretty happy about but we were like oh dude like that, that was a kind of felt like a rough one yeah in the end it seemed one-sided but uh while playing it it seemed like a really rough one so this is game number two and this comes to no surprise we knew that they're gonna pick coastal or golden heights for 3v3 because that's the maps that they practice for in 3v3 and we basically had a plan in mind it ended up being a mirror match as you guys can see so uh, last week we played against uh, Mista and the Spanish bros and Mista did uh, a build with Avacid that was basically like uh, just being like double dock uh, into three docks, four docks, and then just fishing ships. And then you go for super early castle. And he just made mass camel riders. And we went for cavalry. I went for camel archers. Marine Lord went for knights. So the camel riders just like just, just destroyed us, right? So we knew that they're going to obviously know that. We knew that they watched that match. So we knew that there's a high potential they're going to do the same thing. So our plan for this map, we knew they're going to pick it in 3v3. So we had pre-picked sieves. We, we knew that this is what we want to play. And 
there were two options. Either they go for Abbasid as well, or they don't. That was our metric of looking at this, how to do the strat. So if they didn't do Abbasid, I would have done the Camel build. I practiced it quite a lot um, versus AIs to execute it really, really well because I was playing the Abbasid. And if they, if they picked Abbasid too, we were sure that they're going to do Camel Riders because they saw the, how good it was and they saw that we lost against it. So in that case, what we decided to do is actually make no cavalry. We decided to go with zero cavalry mass infantry. And we said maybe in the game, Marine Lord opens with two, three knights and I open with two, three camel archers. So they think we're doing cavalry, so they fully commit. And then we just transition to mass barracks archer ranges and we do mass infantry push on the Abbasid. That was our plan. That was our goal. That's the mindset we were going with. So there was another, uh, I guess, thing to look out for is where does Kazva spawn? Because Kazva in all their water maps, in all our practice and in all tournaments has been going for Rus, even if it's Golden Swamp. And then goes for mass archer ships, like mass water, just he does not fight on land at all, which we thought was a big weakness. Uh, not like Kazva specifically, but that kind of gameplay. Because we knew that Kazva is going to commit to water, so we basically said pregame, whoever is on the Kazva side, you have to defend yourself, right? Like you have to be aware that he is not going to make the two ships, he's going to make like 15. So we, we knew this. So... Our best possible spawn is me being in the middle because you want Abbasid to be uninterrupted with double or triple docks. Um, and they had that spawn, so that was pretty good for them. And I was on Ruth's side, which is the worst case scenario for us because you want Abbasid to be the one uninterrupted because Abbasid can boom the most on water. Uh, so that was unfortunate. So when we scattered, I was like, oh, Kazma is next to me. So I... I don't know how fast I can get castle without actually losing the water. Because I'm not only protecting my water. If I lose the water, then the Muslim loses the water and then Marine Lord loses the water. So, we were playing this. So this game starts off normally, everyone's docking as you do on water maps. So this is where I saw castles next to me, so I'm like, fuck, I gotta defend. And I, to be honest, I don't really, uh, I haven't really practiced how to do the the, the just Abbasid on coastal while defending but not committing on water while getting to castle making units so I didn't practice that so literally in the middle of the game I think it was like around three four minutes I just said on discord fuck it I'm just gonna go full water I'm like I'm not gonna go any land I'm just gonna commit fully to the water because Kazva is gonna commit a lot to the water and I don't know if they're going to expect Abbasid to commit to water. So I'm just going to fully commit. And because I have better fishing eco, I can actually overwhelm their side and I can push into their water eco. And I was like, I didn't think they're going to expect that, right? And I was like, I'm not going to make any units. I'm going to have delayed castle. You guys need to defend me. And I'm going to do early walls so that I, I uh, like walls so that camera riders can harass me. But you guys got to send me... You have to defend me. I'm not going to make any units. And I just told them, when once they, they start making units, they're like, who do we go for? And I said, because I had Scout, you'll see later, around Kazva's base. And I was like, Kazva has no units. Just run into Kazva. If you delay his wood uh, gathering, I can break him with water because I'll just have more ships. So... Because they did this every time, we felt it was very predictable and they played like right into it. And exactly that happened. Kazu committed to water, he had no units, they had no walls on his side. And you'll see in a, in a little bit what happened. So I'm gonna speed this part up because now this is just booming. Booming from everyone. But yeah, this is me just keeping tabs on Kazva. Because the way this map works is like, if you're on the sides, you're a bit closer to your opponent than the middle guys. So if he makes horsemen, he has to make spearmen. Basically the way it works. Or like whatever units to counter it, right? Because you're close to each other. Because blue player is not going to harass orange. Blue is going to harass yellow. 
So I kept track if he's gonna make any knights, which he didn't. Which I was very happy about. So I have a really good fishing eco. I have 13 ships and about to have 4 docks. My feudal was the latest because I went greedy. Um, and because Kaz waves up first, I asked the Muslim to make a Springle ship immediately and send it over to me. So that he can buy me some time. Another thing why Abbasid can be decent against this strat. I split up my docks except these two. So they're very spread out. So what I did is I left... I'm going to move another ship here. So I left three ships per dock. So if he attacks here, I just dock all three ships and I just fish the other places. If he goes here, I release these fishing ships, go fish. I put these in the dock. So even though Rus is usually very good save against Abbasid, I don't think it's that good in team games on this map. So you'll see. He leaves the thing. He quickly decides to go for these ones. I get another dock, dock those, pull some fishing ships there to another dock, and basically he didn't do any damage and the Muslim's war jump arrives. So yeah, my fishing, I didn't lose anything, it gets a little interrupted because I had to move stuff around, but it was completely fine. And this is where I just go full water, no units, and soon I'll start walling. So they're doing the build that we thought they would do because of the, the game that they saw from Mista. So Wen is going instantly into castle and he did the camel rider build. And he actually uh, pulled some workers off of wood. Uh, he has a lot of ships, 19, 20. Uh, and soon he's gonna start making stables. He's already getting castle, so yeah, very good stuff. So the Muslim asked me like, where do you want the ships? I'm like, just leave them there. I'm just gonna mass units without trying to show too much. And again, I'm getting my eco upgrades. I don't plan, like I have no gold, right? Obviously I have a lot of food because of all the fishing, but um, I had no plans to rush castle. And this is where I started walling off for uh, camel riders or knights, whatever. So this is the thing. This is the thing with Rus and transforming ships. If you look, he has four fishing ships right now. So if you look at Kaz's economy, 225-3, right? 38 villagers. If you look at my economy, I have 45, 15, 16, 12, but this is 15 fishing ships. So even if you count the Rus ships, uh, one Rus fishing ship is two normal fishing ships. I still had 15 and he had like 8 total. So that's double the food economy that I had. So I knew that at this point, Kazo will be forced to play feudal for a long time because it's very hard to take up with Rus if you commit that early to water. So this is where I had my scout and every once in a while I would check and I was like, guys, he has no units. And because the Muslim was in the middle position, um, He's the one that should go like giga greedy and he did go giga greedy. He had a fuck ton of fishing ships. How many is that? He had 19 fishing ships. I guess that's where he stopped. And he just aged up to castle super fast. And this is where he just started spamming palace guards. So basically Abbasid in their team is what the Muslim is in our team. They are supposed to be the greedy ones with like zero units and go for uh, mass stuff. So I think this is, uh, yeah, this is where Ben asks, like, where do I attack? And I was like, just go for Rus. Like, he has nothing. He has no units. And this is where I was like, wall off, wall off, start walling, or I'm gonna get fucked. <laughs> so yeah, he just rallies straight to Kazva. Kazva is nowhere near uh, castle. Because Rus, like I said, with this kind of water eco, cannot go that fast castle. And I think in a little bit... Uh, well, in a little bit, in a minute or two, I'll start my own castle slowly. So yeah, if you look... He tries to fight me in water, by the way, but I actually have more, which I don't think he expected. The camel riders are going. I'm trying to wall. 
And yeah, the Muslim just has so many fucking palace guards. He has plus one range. And this is where... Honestly, this is where the game is over. Right here. That's... It's over. This is very hard to come back from at a top level. Because right now, I am constantly producing fighting ships. And Kazva's production is halted completely. So even if all these palace guards die, these 12 guys just die, and they kill nothing, but they force idle time, that is still extremely worth, because they're about to lose the whole fishing eco on the bottom side. So he goes in here, and obviously he doesn't have enough space to put all the bills, so he just starts losing bills. So instead of Abbasid attacking me now with his full force, because I don't have units, he has to re-rally to defend uh, Kazva. And because the Muslim are right first, we have the advantage. Uh, on the other side, I almost managed to full wall here. I should have sent another one or two villagers. If I did wall, it would be super game over. But he does get with some camels, and this is where I'm like, uh, I need, I need you to rally units, I need help, I need help. I have nothing, like, uh, nothing is, no towers, no units, nothing. So I'm like, I'm just, like, on this card, I'm like, you need to protect me, like, you need to send me units. If I don't die or take villager losses, we win. Like, I'm about to break the water, just defend me. So, someone asked, where is, uh, uh Marine Lord in this whole time? Um, so... So Marine Lord had a weird fight with Puppy Paw. So Puppy Paw decided to also go for water, but not fully commit, kind of go water, but also go castle. So Marine Lord and Puppy Paw kind of had a battle on water here, which eventually Marine Lord loses or Puppy Paw pushes through because Marine Lord uh, committed to ground fully, exactly like we planned. You can see he went for a few nights to harass. Um, and then he just committed to full ground. Five arch rangers, three barracks, which again was our plan. We saw camel riders, so the plan was working out. So he's just committing to mass units, and you can see, because I was molding come help, he sent these units to also assist, because Ben is uh, killing Kazva, and I'm about to push on water uh, as well. Um, Oh yeah, and I reached castle. I forgot to say that. Can I swap these? Oh no, I can. Can I not swap in team games on this thing? Anyway. Uh, so yeah, I also reached castle. I forgot to say that. And because I reached castle, this is the good thing about Abbasid. Because I have Culture Wing, this upgrade that gives Spriggle ships plus one range and 20... What is it? 20% more damage, I think? I actually don't know what it gives exactly. Plus one range and 20% attack faster, yeah. So plus one range is obviously sick. And I got the 20% health and plus one armor on all my ships. Castle is still in feudal, so I'm like, it's time to go. Uh, ben buys some time with these palace guards, but obviously camel riders beat palace guards. But soon the spearmen uh, start arriving as well. He does a little bit of damage here, uh, but nothing too like game ending. And I'm already pushing on Kazma's side. He's transforming like almost all his fishing ships into fighting ships. He reaches castle and the moment I saw that I just decided to push through before he gets his upgrades. So I just forced the fight. I get some decent demo hits. Or oh, one demo hit. And yeah, this is where the docks start going down. Yeah, that's both of his docks, by the way. He has no more docks. So now they got two options. They either lose the water completely, like I'll just push all the way through, or Wham has to start making water. And the thing is, if Wham has to make water, then that means that he's going to have less units on the ground. Uh, which, again, is, is pretty good for us, right? We're winning either way. And right now, Kazva has nothing. He has no ground units, he has no water, and like I said, the moment the Muslim came in here, the game was pretty much over. So yeah, he does some more harassment here. I have some towers. Um, at this point, you know, he's not really flooding too many units. He's just kind of just slowly trickling in. 
On the other side, Marine Lord started getting pushed a little bit, but then um, the Muslim and Marine Lord defended that side of the water. Together, I started pushing into the Wham. And because I won the water, aka I beat, you know, one of them, um, I just start transitioning to Mass Barracks to do the ground push and finish of the game. <clears throat> And then Marine Lord also starts pushing China on water, on the ground, sorry. He seems like he has way more units. Your team win. Watching so much of your content. Thanks for the effort. Here you deserve my prime less than three. Thank you so much, appreciate it, thank you, thank you. And yeah, again, the Muslim just has so many fucking units. Like if you look at supply, he, I'm at 100, which... Like I didn't lose anything, my EQ's pretty good, I lost water on ships, right? The Muslim has 165, Wham is 90, Poppy for 150, so he had pretty good uh, supply. And then Kazma at 37, so he was super super dead because of all the attacking. So yeah, this is where I just send my crap amount of units, I send my like 50 spears, I'm like, I'm coming! I'm helping! But yeah, he actually transitioned to camel archers at the end, which was kind of interesting. I guess because we went mass infantry, but... At this point, it's over. I'm trying to find Kazu's villagers here, actually, but we didn't realize that he has, like, almost none. And they tap out. So, one thing is funny, because last week, uh, we lost on this map pretty badly, actually. Like, we, we got destroyed, I'm gonna be honest. Like, that game was way closer than the, the game we had last week. We got fucking destroyed, right? <laughs> so, I saw a lot of comments like, oh my god, you guys, like, chimps are so, like, not good at water maps, and they're gonna have to practice like that. You know, they're gonna struggle, and it's like... Don't get me wrong, we got fucking wrecked last week, but we got wrecked by something we never saw before and that was executed really, really well, you know? We went cavalry, they went camel riders, we didn't even think of it, and we were like, oh, fuck. And we were like, okay, well, now we know about that strategy, right? So then we just adapted, and we practiced some water maps, of course, and uh, I think our, like, gameplay in general improved quite a lot. Okay, the next game is the game I didn't play because it was time for Marine Lord and the Muslim to play. So this game was funny as fuck. So we knew, so from a competitive point of view, right, from a mental point of view, we knew we just had a massive advantage there. Because Coastal is their map, you know, that's, the ma that's, their, that's their home map, right? But it's also one of the maps they liked. And the fact that that game was that one-sided and all stuff they prepped just completely failed and they saw us get demolished last week like we we looked the weakest on that map so all those things combined and then you lose on, on that map that badly mentally is not good for you as a competitor because you're like holy fuck like if this is your go-to map and you thought it was our bad map and then you lose that's not good uh for this map we either had to play Marine Lord and I or the Muslim and Marine Lord because Marine Lord was the one that practiced wood chopping uh, so he had to be paired with someone basically because Marine Lord and I played uh, the Muslim and Marine Lord went we discussed what to pick here we had uh, so the original picks was Mongol Abbasid or Abbasid HRE I think so those were our picks for this map so we were 2-0 up, and we were like, okay, well, we just used Abbasid, right? So we were like, let's do... We were discussing which Civ to use, and I was like, let's just go Ottoman HRE. Because on this map, you need a Civ that can make units in Dark Age. You need a Civ. Because sometimes what happens on this map, you both chop through in the middle, and then you just lose a villager to Spearman. So you need to make Spearman to fight the opponent and try to get uh, Doc at the same time. So for those that don't know, you probably haven't seen this map. It's called Oasis. And Oasis has two sacred sides in the middle and a fuck ton of fish. 
Needless to say, whoever gets to the middle first wins the game. Because you can go for Sacred Side win, you can build a landmark inside so you can get a landmark snap, and you build docks and you get all this fish. So whoever gets to the middle first wins. This is all our practice games. 99% of the times, whoever gets to the middle wins, without a doubt. <clears throat> with that being said, uh, I know you guys think I'm memeing, by the way, with the wood chopping, but you kind of need to practice to chop wood here. So this game starts. Marine Lord is our chopper. And this is what happens. Hold on. So you're supposed to find some kind of dent in the forest. Uh, that's like one of the indicators that there's less cutting. So for example, this would be a good place to start. You see it's a little bit shorter than, than this, right? Uh, so he, he goes for here, but that's because he didn't see the dent. It's because he's dented. I don't know why the fuck he started here, but whatever. Um, so like here would be super good. Obviously you can't know where the other side of the if the other side of the wood has free space or not, right? So this would be the perfect case here. So they start in the dent right here. Marine Lord has practiced the chopping about 10, 15, 20 times in custom games. Okay. His best time chopping. You ready? Best time chopping was 210. What that means is at 210 in game time, he chopped through. That was his best time out of like 15, 20 tries. And that, that was one of, I, I've seen like 205 ones with decent RNG. Check this out. Not only they got the dent, which dents happen. There's a dent here, whatever. There's one tree, then there's two trees of empty space. So that's just like, that's like three, four trees gone already. Chops here. Chops here. Chops here. Chops there. Chops there. And they're through. 148. 148. We... Guys, this is, it's not faster. This is 21 seconds faster than we have ever gotten. His forestry wasn't even worth, yeah, his forestry like finished when he was already done. So, so I'm watching this on stream and look at my... started so i was like okay well this is over like this is, that's it like that's it so you're supposed to arrive around same time here like you're su like now you're supposed to maybe chop through like that's the oh difference God. meanwhile marine lord is still fucking chopping right yeah 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 so what marine lord is saying and it's versus Delhi, so you might be like, what does that matter? Well, Delhi's fishing ships can fucking shoot. So they go for barracks, but I think they realize how far behind they're on chopping. So he makes a fishing boat and he rallies it immediately there. Oh, he didn't cancel this, I thought he did. So this is the funny part. So Marilla is fucking chopping and this is 256 is obviously like one of the worst times he's ever had practicing this. Awesome. Right. He even got lucky there. Like this could have been worse. If he went through here, he would need to chop like four more trees. So anyway. So he's chopping, he's chopping and oh, you know, obviously he's, uh, he's got barracks. You know what I mean? He's ready to like fight in the middle. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there you go. He, it's his worst try. Like, worst time. So this is the funniest part. And I could just imagine, I remember watching this on stream, and I was like, I could just imagine Marine Lord coming out here, 
chopping. He's like, oh, Benny, Benny, I'm, I'm true, Benny, I'm true. And then he comes, <laughs> and there's a fish ship around it. He's probably, what the fuck? What the fuck is this shit? So I'm like, yeah, the, it's over. Like, that's it. By the way, I would... When I said whoever reaches the middle usually wins, I don't mean this. I mean like, even if you make the dock first, you get a fishing ship and then the enemy makes a dock, it's still over. Because you have way better eco at the top level. This? It's over, right? So, I'm already looking at the, like, what are we playing next map? Like, I'm thinking what to pick because they're still in the game, right? And then the spearman arrives as well. And by the way, Marine Lord's mom is right here. So they could have also pulled her to fight the, the, the villagers or the army that's coming. So I'm like already thinking about the next game. Because to make the situation worse, he went for the barracks as well. Right? Because he wanted to fight in the middle. So it's like not only he went for Imperial School. He also went for the bear, so he committed more resources into it, which makes the situation way worse. Uh, the Muslim, his goal was to rush feudal and then make dock as he's aging up and make fighting ships. Obviously, <laughs> you know, that did not work out because there's ships already. So he switched to fast castle. So they're pushing them out. And I'm just like, take W. So Marine Lord, obviously, you know, he goes for the attack. What else is he gonna do? So this is the weird part. This is not, like, our strat. This is not, like, pro strat. This is just... It's not even a strat. It's just a thing you do. Which I don't know if they forgot. I don't know if they didn't think that the mid would get contested. I don't know if they just like were nervous. I, I have no idea what happened here. But whatever the fuck you do, you wall this immediately. You wall this immediately, then there's no entry point. You wall this, your chop, and you wall their chop. And you don't wall once, you wall here. You made one layer, one layer of palisade, then you made here, 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 then you made here. That's what you do. Then there's no passing through. And not only that, if they do try to pass through the Muslim and Marine Lord, you'll see them on the first wall. It's it's over. And they got they got Delhi, which he can go for sacred site capture earlier than usual. So this is what happens. They both go for docks. I'm gonna speed through. I'm gonna ignore the, the harassment that happened on the land. Fuck it. <clears throat> So I don't, again, I, I, I didn't ask the Muslim and, Mar and Marine Lord. I don't know if the Muslim went in here and he's like, yo, this is open. Like, we might be able to go in here. I don't know what their comms were. But he goes here and he clearly sees there is no defense. There's a spearman and a spearman, that's it. There's no villager moving. <clears throat> right? So I think this is where... I think it's Marine Lord that pulls the villagers. And still, no wall! Like, they see units coming, no wall. The scout sees both villagers are here. Just chilling. Look, the Muslim pulled the villagers. I don't know if he wanted to go through, or he wanted to start chopping. But it's funny because Marine Lord and, and the Muslim could have made a dock earlier, but I think they, they just thought it's about to get walled, you know? I, I just think that they didn't even bother trying to, to get in at this point because they figured it's going to be walled. So now, they just go in. They send three villagers and two villagers and they just go in. And there's no wall still. And to make the situation worse, not only there's no wall, but there's no fighting ships. Like, if there was a, an archer ship here, arrow ship, or a sprinkle ship, this doesn't work. 
and they have so many fishing ships. They're so far ahead, and they just didn't make anything. And they literally just walk in. They've tried to wall now. And that's it. That's game over. Or maybe, okay, let me, let me rephrase that. Maybe it's not game over, but this is like a huge move, right? It's huge move. Because now you had this old fishing eagle for yourself. Now you might be fucked to, to actually fight on water. Another thing is he can make a sprinkle ship and then he can make a dock here or here and put arrow slits. And then he, arrow slits can pretty much hit like all the way to here. So this is like, now it's bad. And I was like, hold up. Hold up. There is, there is a chance, right? So he's going for another dock. Because now also the sacred side win is not possible, right? I mean, it's possible, but now there's ships coming. So that's, that's also a problem, right? And now they both have to make ships because there's only two docks and both of the docks are from two different players. But they're not making anything. I guess they didn't have eco. There's, there's a sprinkle ship coming and Rindler's making ships too. Meanwhile, the Muslim got Burgrave. And disaster strikes. Yeah, so they're both going fast castle, yeah, because Ben got castle and went Burgrave, so they know this. There's a scout right there. So they're doing the triple layer walling here in case uh, the Mazim or, or Marino try to chop through the woodland, right? Check this. So this, so they show this on stream, by the way. They show this on stream like this. So I'm like, oh fuck, like Ben is sending all his men at arm. Like at this point, I'm like starting to get hyped. Like, oh my god, we, they might do something here. Hold up. Like, it's not over. So, I'm like, oh, that's unfortunate that Ben is sending units here because he can't pass through. So, I literally looked away for for five seconds. And then I look back and men-at-arms are through. And I'm like, what happened? I legit didn't know what the fuck just happened. So, look what happened. He starts a gate. Are you ready? By the way, I don't know why he started this gate. I don't know what the point of this gate was. So I don't know if you guys know, but this is what happened. This is how the game works. Uh, if he made a gate here, the gate is not being built, okay? It's just a blueprint. When a villager comes, like if this is the gate trying to be built, if the villager comes here, the, the building starts getting produced. There's a layer, right? Even though the villager didn't tap it, there's a layer of the building started. So the villager cannot build it from here, but because the villager is close, the gate, as you can see from Riddler's point of view, they can see the gate. The gate has started. And again, if you didn't know, this puts this whole wall segment as a gate now that has no health. So this is the health of this wall right now. So I looked away for five seconds and the units got in and I was like, what the fuck just happened? I was like, what? And then I was like, did I not, was that not walled? Am I blind? So the units get in. He tries to rewall, not gonna work. And the units get in. So Marine Lord is right now winning on water because Ben is pushing the land. So they both have to go crossbows. So that's a big investment. They both have to go archer ranges and crossbows. On the water, Marine Lord doesn't have to make any units on land. I mean, he's fully committed to water. While both of these guys gotta go crossbows. So Marine Lord wins the water. 
Let's make another dock here. For arrow slits, as I mentioned earlier. And men at arms, the age up is finished, they're both castle, but men at arms are not doing damage. So now even if you have crossbows, you're still taking eco damage. And you're about to lose all your water eco, so you have no food income. They're not set up for food income on land. They try to rewall, they mustn't put unit on hold here to not to make to make sure the wall does not happen. And the water is one. So at this point, I'm like, what the fuck just happened? Ben starts going for sacred sites. Arrow slits on this dock, so any comeback on the water is not possible. I'm gonna speed it up here because now we get a little bit of a resident sleeper. Not much is happening. Delhi tries to push and land. It's not gonna work. <clears throat> so now the game switched. Now the Muslim and Marine Lord are walling the land. And they're just trying to defend the water. So he has some fishing ships. He's making a lot of fishing ships. But he has enough on water to be able to defend this. So the Muslim now is just making men at arms everywhere and uh, he's just harassing wherever he can. He doesn't need to trade well, he just needs to force them to not look at the middle basically. So Marine Lord Age is up. The Muslim sends gold to Marine Lord because the Marine Lord is shit, so he needs to help him in some way. He needs to hold his hand and uh, now marine lord goes for grand galleys and yeah i know marine lord, i'm just being you are shit though anyway so he now goes for grand galleys and if you guys don't know you might have not even seen this ship by the way uh in your games or competitive gameplay these ships are extremely fucking strong extremely strong uh Listen, Marine Lord, you didn't qualify for last one, you shit stain. You lost last time to a bunch of, to like rank 300 players. Thank you. You got carried, but it's okay. You made ships. So anyway, uh, he goes for the these ships. So for those that don't know, uh, these ships are unique to Ottomans and they're actually military schools. I am not memeing, this is not a drill. So these ships are actually military schools. They can produce villager, or sorry, they can produce units inside of the ship itself and then you can unload the units uh, outside. You can make, I think, as many of these as you want, but you can upgrade them to military school. You don't pay anything, you just click and they become a military school. But obviously, you, if you have a military, four military schools on land and castle, you cannot make more military schools on water. So, yeah. So they're very expensive. They're 150, 360, 300 gold, which is extremely fucking expensive. So yeah, this does not beat this. But when these bad boys come out, so compare the stats. Hulk is very tanky, right? Very tanky. He's got 450 health. This thing has 750 health. So this is where you turn it into a military school. So yeah. Yeah, that thing is not dying. Oh, but nice micro, by the way. 
see a really good micro right there. Um, the Delhi King, the Masim is Imperial. I guess they were, I don't know, were they trying to landmark snipe? I guess so, right? But that's like, you gotta snipe seven landmarks? That ain't gonna work. I'm actually surprised uh, the, the uh, uh, Marine Lord didn't make more ships. Because I feel like that's kind of low count, it's like five ships. So yeah, it's very hard to break the, the ships on the middle. And this is why I said, whoever gets the middle wins the game. You, see, you can see why. Is this? So yeah, Delhi gets, uh, I mean, Delhi has a massive army, right? But it doesn't really matter. He can't eliminate them both. Why are the ships getting repaired? There's a top right here. You can see it's only repairing this ship because it's in range. And they tap out. And after that game, I knew we won and we possibly win 5-0 because that game again I, I don't know I'm not gonna like say oh this is why they didn't wall I don't fucking know why they didn't wall right but after that game I think their probably morale and everything else was not very good because even if they didn't wall they know they should have not lost that like they know that's a massive advantage to have and uh, yeah <clears throat> So again, from competitive point of view, that is very, very tilting to lose like that. So now we're back to 3v3. Now I'm back in action and they picked Golden Heights, which we felt really good about because we had really good sieves. So I have my Mongols, uh, which is probably my best sieve. Marine Lord is French, which is probably his best sieve. And then the Muslim has Malians, which I'm not sure if it's best sieve. Maybe it's his second best sieve. I'm not sure. But we were all super happy, and obviously these are the sims that each uh, team had remaining, so we knew what we were playing against. It was just a matter of where they wanted to play. Um, so here, we discussed if we go water or not pre-game, and we decided only if I spawn next to water I will go for it. Because we need Marine Lord to age up to feudal immediately to start harassing with knights. And we need Ben to get to castle as fast as possible for Farimba. Uh, for me, I'm, I was gonna go trade anyway. Uh, so, and then Mengura in feudal. So for me, it didn't matter that my castle is going to be a bit delayed. If that means I'll have more Mengura in feudal. So we said, if I spawn next to water, I'll go for water. If you guys spawn, we just play all normally and that's it. Because we're playing against the hamburger strats. Uh, which is Malian feeding the HRE and you don't want to fuck around with that or be too greedy. He went for a blind tower on the gold, expecting me to tower rush. I did not tower rush. I, I didn't even have an Uvu. I just went for a uh, good talk. And uh, like when we saw that, we were like, okay, that's pretty nice, you know. He wasted some resources on that and we we're not even aggressive. Ben spawned next to um, English, which was okay. I think uh, the best one would probably be maybe if Marine Lord spawned to English. Uh, but it was okay either way. So yeah, they did not contest water, so I just kind of water boomed. Because the guy that was next to water was HRE, and HRE can't really contest water. He should be going for the fast castle, and the Malin is feeding him stuff. So the only people that can actually go for water are English and <clears throat> Malians for their team. The problem is the English wants to put pressure on the trade. Or the Malian or the French on our team, so it's kind of weird. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna speed this up. This game was pretty straightforward, to be honest.
I'm also like pretty sure that Kazva could have put two longbows here and attacked these workers. So yeah, Ben went for jab throwers and jab throwers shut down English pretty hard. And that's what happened. So that was good defense. Uh, we tried a like a budget tower rush. Me coming with villager and Khan and then Marine Lord with a knight. But that dons us really early, so we just kind of said fuck it. <clears throat> Let's go home. This is where I hit uh, Feudal and I started making Mangudai. I put my trade over here. And I put one fishing ship here uh, in case the dock happens. I already had a light junk coming and... You know why the dock went up? Because my first shot on the villager, while the villager was AFK by the way, or standing, it fucking missed. I love the RNG. I understand ships missing if the unit is moving, I get that. But the villager was here fucking building and my ship missed. But it is what it is. So I had to make uh, fighting ships, which was okay. So Marine Lord's bullying A3 as much as he can. By the way, why didn't they, uh, they didn't feed? I wasn't aware that they didn't feed at all. Wait, what? Marine Lord, were you aware? I didn't even realize, even in the game, that they're not feeding him. I saw the farms and I thought that was fucking weird. It's been nerfed? Yeah, but it, it's still, like, not bad. It's still free food. I guess because it's 90 gold now, maybe they didn't think it was worth it. But I feel like this strat then is, is way worse. Like, it got nerfed, but it's... Yeah, I, I don't think... I don't think you do this strat then. I think you just go Cathedral or something. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like, if you're not gonna do the feed strats, Atri should have gone for water and then Regnant, so I agree with that. And Malian should have went fast castle and English pushed. Yeah, I actually didn't realize this, that they had no cows. So here I start my own trade with uh, Marine Lord's Market. I didn't want to be too greedy to go to neutral market. There's no need, because this is so safe for us. I made more and more Mangudai. I defended their own water, eventually I win the water. So this is the part where we were very confused, and I remember Marine Lord saying, I don't know where men at arms are. Because at this point there should be men at arms in our base. And we tried to, like we're waiting for men at arms to come, and uh, we were like, we don't know where the men at arms are. We, like, we were confused in game what they were doing because the men at arms were not coming. There's a burger, but there's no unit production out of it. And again, he could have just taken the relics. <clears throat> so we were kind of confused a little bit here because I'm making a lot of mango at this point. They go on this side and we spot them in a little bit, so we just go to defend that. Oh, I pick off a couple of uh, men at arms here. We go for a raid. This is where I push back the uh, Mali on the water. Oh yeah, and the Raven Marine Lord's base here. So we were like, okay, let's go defend. And as we're going... I get raided in my base, so I have to go defend that. There's some donzos and jab throwers. This gets cleaned up completely, by the way. They killed like one trader. Um, yeah, and they killed like another trader here, which I mean, I don't need to tell you losing two full armies for two traders is not worth it. 
So my trading right now, I'm in 21, doing pretty well. I got fishing. I got like... How many fishing boats is this? 12 fishing boats. So my eco is just fucking pumping right now. And... Am I castle yet? No, I'm not castle yet. So he, here he has men at arms, and even though my main good are a feudal, I just have so many that... Like, I'm still killing them slowly, you know? Now we got uh, Musafari warriors, which completely destroy the fucking men at arms. We kill some, not too many. Oh, I just killed my own sheep there. Uh, Marine Lord goes for a raid. He sees the trade. So, the fact that we saw this, we knew that they're not trading. Because we just saw the trade that's getting built from HRE. And that's not for HRE trade. That's to have Malian to trade something to. So we knew that they have no trade, which was really good. Um, and yeah, I mean, my trade is in, you know, full power. Uh, the Muslim here kind of defended English on his side. He has a shit ton of units. Like, if you look at our map control, we have vision pretty much, like, all, all the way up to their base. I started building towers everywhere as well to give us vision uh, even more. Yeah, this is where my veteran Mangura finish, and now they do 13 damage I hit. So you can see the difference now in how much damage they're doing compared to earlier. So yeah, HRE at this point is pretty useless. Like, men at arms against knights, Musifadis, and Mangudai is just not doing anything. So here we go for the massive engagement. And because there are javelins, I was like, I'm just gonna run by around. And Ben is like, I'm just gonna go in. And I was like, yeah, go for it. Like, just fucking YOLO in. Because even if he loses everything, we kill Eco, and I get to raid behind. I check for this gold, I check for trade, and Ben's just like demolishing everything on this side. There's a Kuril tie here, if needed for later on. Mm. And GG! So again, this is one of the maps. This is the map that we actually lost in practice every single time against them. Uh, this was one of our worst maps. So again, winning here for us, we were like, fuck yeah! You know, we were like chilling. And now this is the funny part. So now all 10 sieves are played for both teams. So now you might wonder what now? Well, now the sieves reset. So now we can play any sieves. So now we had our four home maps because this is 4-0 right now. So we have our four home maps and this is their last home map. So they have to win here or they're out. And it was wetlands. So. Uh, wetlands, the best combos are uh, Mongol English, uh, English French, Mongol Ottoman, maybe Mongol French, right? Those are the best sieves. So we were like, okay, initially we were gonna go for strong sieves. And we were like, okay, let's, let's not pick good sieves. Let's just pick so so sieves. Even in the, we've never played this combo. Uh, and let's just have Mongol, French, uh, and English for Prairie. We still have that. So we can play Mongol, English, uh, French on Prairie in 3v3. We would have China, Abbasid, Rus for, uh, or HRE for the water maps that we have. Or semi-water, I guess, like Golden Swamp. So I was like, let's just make sure that we have picks for the other maps instead. So, Mongol English is the best 2v2 comp, by far. It, it, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly strong. Um, they can both be aggro in Dark Age, they have like the best aggression, they can tower rush, they can go trade. 
that have the late game. In my opinion, it's the best 2v2 combo. Uh, for, for open maps, obviously, not water maps. But like Dry Arabia, Pit, um, Wetlands, Prairie. You, you cannot go better than that. For a simple reason is that this combo hard counters any French. So if there's French against these, uh, it gets tower rushed on his gold, and you can't contest in Dark Age because of uh, meta arms and spears. So, we went for Mali and Ottoman, and we decided to fight in Dark Age, and just kind of go for it, right? Because we knew they're gonna be aggressive. Like, why would you pick these sieves if you're not gonna be aggressive? So we knew that they're gonna go aggro. The question was if they're gonna go men at arms or not, or just, or just tower rush. So I decided to go gold pit first and then barracks because I didn't want to go barracks first because if they're not going men at arms, then barracks first is kind of stupid. So. I went gold pit, then I scouted, and I saw men at arm coming here, and I was like, okay, I'm going barracks as well. And their rush didn't do anything. Like, they, I don't think they ever wanted to tower rush. I don't think they ever brought a villager with them. No, they didn't. So it was just, uh, like, spear men at arm pressure on my goal, basically. So they kill one house, and then Gonzo start coming out, so they bail. And it, overall, we didn't take any damage here. We defended, and we felt pretty okay, like after this. Like, not like we're super far ahead, but I didn't take any damage. My gold income is going. Also, I had early cows, because uh, Wetlands only has five sheep around their base. So, I was feeling pretty good, and we were both, we both, I think, aged up later than they did, but, um, yeah, like I said, it was okay. So, we kill all of this, we decide to do a counter push. In a little bit, we'll age up. <clears throat> yeah, so, he was almost out of sheep, he had some villagers on, uh, fish. So we counter push, you know, nothing major, we're not gonna end the game here or anything, but just forcing them to make more units, basically. So this is funny. So on this side, Kazva aged up first, compared to me. So I figured if we attack this side, Kazva's gonna go help him with longbows. So I looked at the map layout. And I was like, if I make my landmark here, which is giga far away from TC, it's a little risky, but it's gonna protect this. And if I wall here, Job. then this gold is safe, this gold is safe, this gold is safe completely. So I have three golds for free. They would have to go all the way around to reach these golds, which is just ain't gonna work, right? So I get the landmark. Which was really nice. And from here on out, uh, Ben said, I'm just gonna go, I'm not gonna go for feudal archers, I'm just gonna go castle. And I was like, Do you, are you sure you don't wanna contest trade? And he's like, no, let's just go, both go castle and just go like completely overwhelmed with units. And I was like, sure, let's do that. Sounds good. Because Ottoman in castle is, is scary as fuck with knights and, and cavalry in general. So, he just went like, basically no units, right? He had military school, that's it. I went no units, because I can't be harassed anywhere. I got food here, I got gold here. So, there's nowhere for my opponent to harass me. And they both made units, by the way. They both made like archers, Mangudai, and whatever else. So we knew we we're gonna hit castle first. So here he's trying to find some damage, there is none. I age up. He starts chopping here. Do I yes go around? 
but he stops then and goes somewhere else and this is the big oof I think he grouped this scout with these units and then moved it and I see that and I snap that immediately English with no scout fucking sucks oh he chopped through actually right so now he has no vision. He could potentially put longbows here, but I don't think that reaches unless he chops through. So now he chops through, but I'm already in castle. The Muslim is aging up to castle. And they're both uh, in feudal at this point. <clears throat> Poppy Boy is making transition to stables for Lancers. There's the age up. And he decides to move his TC there. I don't know why he moved it there specifically, but... All right. Some mango harassing. This was kind of monka actually, because the Muslims workers were all running. Look at this, all idle. So I was like, uh oh. My Farimba finished, and this is where honestly Malians and Ottomans are the strongest. Um, like we're both just fucking printing units. The militaries. Look at this. Four military schools. Um, the armor is well printing for free and then I got Parimba just crafting units the whole time so uh, we decided to go for the or I decided to go for the push on the trade the Muslim was getting pushed here a little bit and he managed to defend got a clutch save with the mango check that out so here, because Kasva just reached castle, and I got this many units, and they're all castle units, I felt pretty good to just go for it. And I figured, even if they come to defend, because now Ben is going to counter push the bottom side, even if they come to defend, if my goal is to just run here and kill the traitors. Even if I lose the army, my army from this point on is just, uh, it's just printing, right? Like it's non-stop production. I'm not... Sacrificing anything to produce units. So I go immediately into the trade, and now here I'm just trying to defend the trade basically. I get a couple of Mangodai picks here, I start picking off longbows. And overall, they, they clean me up here, but meanwhile, Ben has so many knights here. I sent all my units on this side, and this is kind of like, you defend one side, great, but then there's a push on the other side. Uh, Poppy loses some production, nothing major, he loses the, the blacksmith, which is pretty big. And we just rotate around, again, we're just going for the trade. So this is, this is a funny part. So right now, look at these armies, right? Their army looks pretty fucking big, right? So, the funny part is, we go for a fight here, and we think we're gonna mow them down, because we got a, we got mangoes, but they actually had a spring ult soon. So we were going for a fight here, and then spring ult comes out, and we're like, oh fuck, because without mangoes, we can't kill the longbows fast enough, so... I'm like, just, just pull back, let's just run into the, the trade. So I'm like, okay, fuck it. I'm, I'm dipping. I just said, I'm, I'm gonna go for the trade, fuck it. So I aim with these Donzos around the Mangunel, so it protects against knights. I'm pushing the top side again. I have like three gold uh, pits. I'm getting the cows ready to, you know, go Imperial eventually. And, um... Here I was like, fuck it, we're gonna lose this fight, it's okay, I'm just gonna kill as many traitors as I can. Because again, he has free units, and I basically have free units with gold, you know? So check this out, one traitor, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16. I'll take the villagers as well. 17. And then my reinforcements from 
were attacked just now here. Just arrived, so I gathered all my units again. <clears throat> now, I do want to say, there were a couple of people that are like saying that I'm doing BM wall of laws because I just killed traitors. You know, fucking lunatics that are like, oh, Beast is such a piece of shit, he's doing wall of laws to BM his opponents. I'm doing wall of laws, you stupid mother truckers, to distract the opponents. You know why? Because we're attacking them here. Uh, we're attacking them here. They're losing trade. It's game five. They're under pressure. So what I was doing is I was picking up relics and wall along in my base. So they wouldn't know where the wall along is at. They have to look everywhere on the map. Because the opponent here is wall along, but they don't know where the fuck it is. So I was picking up relics and wall along. And somehow these idiots... These morons were calling me a dick and a piece of shit because I was trolling my opponents. You dumbass. Does it distract the Muslim? No, because I, whenever I wall along in team games, I, uh, I tell my teammates. I always say I'm gonna wall along, uh, or it's my wall along, so that my ally doesn't have to look. And also, they both have to look for Walla Law. Not just one guy. But I actually wonder if they do look or if they just ignore it. So I think Walla is gonna come in a second here. The second one. Let's see. I mean, there's not many places to wall a lot, right? Like, we have the whole map, but it's still a good distraction, and that's why you do it. They don't even got time to look at it. But yeah, that's the whole point of it, and that's why I do it. And I also did this in, um, was it game one? I think it was game one. I also did the, the wall of laws. Yeah, it's because it's the second one. Yeah, maybe. I mean, also the game is kind of over. Like, trust me guys, these guys know that they're, they're dead. Like, I mean, he lost all the trade. He has zero trade. You kick it. So the Muslim is pushing here. Uh, I am making the age four landmark over here. And this is the funny part. Kazma pulls all his villagers, or not all, but a lot of his villagers. To try and stop this, but I beat his army, so it ain't gonna work. <laughs> There it is, brothers. There it is. And uh, yeah, like I said, we, we ended up winning. We got first place. I think first place was $12,000. So obviously split by three of us. A couple of things I want to say. Uh, Cyril, a lot of people uh, managed to mold about that too. Why is Cyril not playing? This is a scam. They, they, they're, uh, they're just baiting us. I have said many times, including Marine Lord and Muslim, Cyril was never meant to play, ever, unless one of us did not show up. Okay? We've said this many times. Um, Cyril, by the way, is pretty good in team games. He's played a lot in, like, before the ranked, in quick, before rank came out in quick match, he was, like, rank 15 on your, on, uh, in the world in 2v2s. So he has some experience in team games. Uh, does Cyril even play A4? Yeah, he plays A4 uh, pretty regularly, I would say. Like every two, three days he does a couple of games. But he only plays team games. And he's been playing since release. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, I do want to say that... You know, we did look a little bit shaky in the semifinals, but I think in the finals, like, everything kind of clicked. Um, 
we prepared well, all three of us. Um, we did our part. Like, I think every week before that, when we played, you could say, like, oh, this guy played better, or this guy played better, or this guy played worse than the rest. I think for the finals, all three of us showed up. All three of us did what they were supposed to. No one, like, choked. No one fucked up anything. Uh, everything went according to plan. And uh, we got the dub. So I think Marine Lord Dimas and I, like, just worked really well as a team. Uh, and in the end, I thought we had pretty good synergy. We had pretty good understanding. It also helps that three of us have a similar understanding and approach to the game. We didn't have like, we didn't have like one guy that's super all in and one guy that's super late game. And it's like, one guy's like, no, we should all in them. And the other guy's like, no, we shouldn't. You know, like every strat we discussed, we were kind of in sync how we want to do stuff. We understood why the other guy wants to do stuff. And it, it, it was pretty easy to, to kind of discuss these things and, and agree upon. So yeah, it, I, it was great. Like we, we had a lot of fun, I think, playing. It was fun. Like I wanted to play every day. Like I, I just wanted to play the tournament matches. It was a lot of fun. I did enjoy it. Um, do I hope there's more team tournaments in the future? Yeah. Do I want team tournaments to take over? No. Right? I wouldn't mind if we had one big team tournament a year, or maybe two, uh, but I wouldn't want team tournament over one-on-one -on -one tournaments. Also, I would personally prefer if the next tournament is 2v2, uh, not because I didn't enjoy playing 3v3s or because I didn't enjoy uh, like playing with one of the teammates or something like that. It's just getting the practice in was a mess because like you had to get 2v2 practice but then 3v3 practice but then you couldn't really practice because there's also civil limitations where it's like you can't just play whatever in 3v3 because you have to save some for 2v2 so it was just weird um overall it was kind of hard to schedule because it's six players like when you practice 3v3s you need six players in customs which is a lot uh we did play ladder but like we we've had like 95 or 96 percent winners on the ladder so the practice wasn't great we were like stomping most of the people and also the maps on the ladder are different so i think 2v2 tournament would be a lot better uh because it's easier to organize now what i would like to see i'm looking at you pesty i would like to have the next tournament i don't mind the format too much but it would be cool if we had the next tournament a team tournament but it's uh it starts with a one-on-one -on -one. so let's say marine lord and i have teammates it starts off with a one-on-one -on -one. so marine lord plays first ah there's pest in the chat pesty listen just saying just saying i like the format i think 3v3 maybe a little too many players what if we did teams but it goes one-on-one -on -one. let's say marine lord plays first for someone then we play 2v2 then i play the one-on-one -on -one. I'm just saying. Then it's not a team game, right? What do you mean it's not a team game? There's plenty of team games in the world that are one-on-ones, but they're still team games. And also this has a 2v2. Um, also, another team-oriented is... Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm not, I'm not like, uh, you know, telling Pesty exactly, like, what to do now. Like, it, it's, it's his thing. He does what he wants, right? These are just things that I would like to see. And obviously, uh, that's up to people to decide at the end of the day what people want to watch. Another thing that I miss quite a lot from back in the day, from my StarCraft 2 days, is having teams, but not like, uh, not like 3v3 games, but like teams of four players, and it's basically like a clan war of four 1v1s, and if it's a 2-2, the ace match, uh, if the score is 2-2, then the ace match is a 2v2 match. I always thought that was fun too, because it promotes team play, it promotes like uh players discussing among each other like okay where do you want to go like i can play on dry arabia and i can pick this sieve and then the other guy's like okay i can play on on um whatever coastal and i'll play china and you know whatever so i think that's another cool aspect of team games where it's not necessarily just focused on team games it's focused on one-on-ones with a potential of 2v2 so i thought that was pretty cool too uh ace match could be 4v4 or that yeah yeah or that i think that would be pretty fun um I do love the idea that, that EGC TV and, and Pesty actually did a team game tournament because I think a lot of people enjoyed it. 
I think it's good to switch it up. I don't think it's good to only have one on one tournaments wow, forever. Is very nice. Thank you, Salami, very for, nice. so much for Raid. I hope you had a great stream. I do think that it's good to mix it up, but if you never tried anything, then you don't know what's good and what can stick in the long run, right? Um, even if this event was a disaster and people hated it, right? Which wasn't. A lot of people loved it and people enjoyed watching it. I think it's still good to try out stuff. I think it's better to try stuff and fail the format than to just always do one-on-ones and nothing else. So that's my personal opinion. Bestie says, well, I have to do one team a year uh, and three or four one-on-one -on -one long term. Uh, it's cool, but we won't do it more than one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, I agree with that. I think, I think having team tournaments is cool, but it shouldn't overtake one-on-ones. Another thing that people kind of molded about is the fact that Marine Lord and I were in the same team, <laughs> which I found funny because it just it just haters, you know, like it just molding fucking haters, right? But uh, they were like, eh, "What did you expect when you put two uh, like of the best one-on-one -on -one players together in a team? Of course, they're gonna win." Uh, like, who are we supposed to play with, right? The Canadians had their own team. It's it just a stupid argument. Why is nobody molding it like football or, or, or like basketball teams because they entered two? Like, it's just weird, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's like, what do you mean? Marine Lord, uh, me and the Muslim? Look at Vortex, Mist, and Lucifer. Like, what the fuck do you mean? It's actually, by the way, if you look at it from Red Bull Wall of Law, each team had a finalist, right? Mist and, uh, Mist and Marine Lord. Each team had a semi-finalist in me and Lucifron, and then each team had one guy that was like uh, 9 to 12, which is the Muslim and Vortex. It's actually the same teams. But because we won, people were molding that our team is like too stacked. Give me a break. Uh, so anyway, two more things I wanted to say is two months ago, just before this tournament started, I have said one thing. And then I said, clip it and wait for the tournament to be over. And that thing, do you know what that thing was? It was something regarding uh, team games. You guys remember what that was? When the tournament was announced, I made my team. And I said, the top four will be all one-on-one -on -one players. Because one-on-one -on -one players are just better than team game players. It does not matter what strats you have. It does not matter how you think they're gonna do some secret strats. The one-on-one -on -one players will dominate. I've, I've heard this argument in StarCraft. One-on-one -on -one players always dominated. And I said, it will happen again and you can clip it and I'll see you when the term is over. And guess what? The tournament ended and top four teams were all one-on-one -on -one players. And I remember there was a couple of guys in my chat that got real feisty. They said, listen, you and Marine Lord are good, but you stand no chance against the strats of 2v2 players. And people, again, people were very adamant about this. Like they were, they were like, this one guy almost started throwing shit at me. Almost started flinging shit how convinced he was that, that our team is gonna lose because we're one-on-one -on -one players with no team play. In the end, one-on-one -on -one players did win. I do want to say the Chinese team that was top four that lost to uh, uh, three beavers in a turkey, technically they are a 2v2 team, but also not because two of their players were top 10 on the ladder in one-on-one -on -one at the time of the tournament. I think you're only half right about that. Team game players did overperform. Two pure team game players made it final top eight. No, no, no. Listen, I never said that team, team game players are terrible and they're not going to reach top 64. I said there will not be any team players. Team players like like uh, like the Korean team that played. That's a, I consider that a uh, team game team. Or the uh, Chinese team with Flash. It was three team game players and Flash, which is a one-on-one -on -one player. I said that none of them are going to reach semi. And none of them did. Um, because at the end of the day, guys, maybe we don't know as much about team games. And for sure, we didn't. For sure, when we started this, we had a completely different version of what we think is good in team games. But over time, we learned, we adjusted the strats, 
And this is what happened. This was their this was their uh, uh, knowledge of team games, the team game players. This was ours. We caught up. Maybe maybe we even went a little bit farther up. But let's say we caught up, right? Let's say we're in the same uh, length of knowledge about team games. This is the problem. This is our skill level in one on one. This is theirs. And they did not catch up. That stayed the way it is. So basically what ended up happening is we just caught up with the with the knowledge and we were still better players in the end. And that's why team players in any game, in any RTS, cannot be better if the RTS is mechanically uh, requiring. So I don't mean like Hearthstone, you know, because it's like you can play it with one hand. Uh, but any RTS that's like StarCraft, Age of Empires, Brood War, the one-on-one -on -one players will usually win. That's it. I do think that team game players, like the Korean team probably was most impressive from the team uh, team game players because I've never seen any of them. They have their own strats and uh, they reach pretty far. So I think that's cool. Exactly, strats can be formulated. I mean, you, I, if we're, let's say we're super dumb, like three of us are, are dented as hell. We can s copy their strats. We don't even gotta think, we can just copy them. They can't copy our mechanics. You know what I mean? They can't just copy Marine Lord's Night Harassment or like my understanding of Mongols or whatever. Like that doesn't happen. You need months and months of prep for that. Louis MT and Co are super good. Well, we play them in uh, in group stage, we beat them. And also, they, they technically they are team game players, but they also are very high ranked on one on one ladder. So I would say that team is kind of like a mix. They were top of the ladder in team games, but they also had top of the ladder in one on ones. But overall, I think the tournament was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. This rant was fucking long. Uh, and last thing I want to shout out is our opponents. I think uh, I think the matches were pretty hard overall. I think that Los Pollos Hermanos, obviously, we you know they they got us to the last game, and we could have easily lost four three, and then we wouldn't be in the finals, you know. And competitive play, that's how it works. Like sometimes you just lose one game, you make one mistake and you're, that's it, you're out of the tournament. I do want to say that uh, for the three beavers in a turkey team, uh, a lot of people were like, maybe maybe being a little too hard on them. Like guys, they, they played way better in practice. Um, I think they played really well game number one. I think they played well game number two, and after that you just kind of see it, it, it fell apart, right? It wasn't... It just kind of fell apart after that, and you saw it in their gameplay and their decision making, and uh, you know, it is what it is. I'm not also sure, but I think it was all of theirs first final in a big tournament. I'm not 100% sure on this, but I think. So that also might have come into play. I wasn't nervous, the Muslim was nervous, Marine Lord was nervous. We played in the like big tournaments before and it's a big deal and it's very hard to perform in your first big tournament in the finals. Almost always whoever gets to the finals for the first time loses. I think overall uh, they played really well. They got second and you know who knows like another day another play time maybe we lose game number one and and you know the games go different ways so Sometimes even if the score is like 5-0 and it might seem super one-sided, you know, on another day it could have been a lot different. If you're watching this on YouTube, I want to thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this long-ass fucking four-hour review. And if you're watching on Twitch, let's play some ladder games. <clears throat> Boom.